I think this is the essence of why we are put on the planet, and no matter what or where we come from, we all have that potential inside of us. Coming from central Los Angeles, I am sure growing up in the 60s you may have experienced racism or things that challenged you. Handling situations like racism, segregation or bullying is tough. How has that affected who you are today? And does this give you a better insight into teens today? Growing up in South Central Los Angeles, um, there were the best of times and the worst of times. I got my first taste of what racism was really all about probably when I was uh, eight or nine years of age. My parents uh, was driving us to uh, Louisiana, which is in the south, and this was in 1968. As we went through Texas, uh, Dallas, Texas, and on the outskirts of Dallas, Texas, there was a town, I don't remember the name of the town, but we were pulled over by the police. Um, the police officer said that um, the car was unregistered, the tires were flat, we had a broken tail light, so they actually escorted us into uh, one of the jails uh, in Texas, and they physically made us stay um, in a little room overnight. And my father, I looked at his face. He knew that there was nothing physically that he could do about it. He had to endure the racial slurs. He had to endure the treatment. He had to just endure the whole uh, powerless fact of him not being able to do anything. And as I watched him, I was waiting for some reaction. And the only reaction that he got was, I have to do everything I can to save my family. The next morning, they let us drive uh, on, but I remember that throughout my life because I remember that it wasn't his reaction to the color of anyone else's skin. It was his reaction to the situation. And I grew up realizing that it doesn't matter what people say about you or how they feel about you or it doesn't matter what their thoughts are as to your circumstances. It doesn't matter about the color of their skin. The only thing that matters is you being big enough to understand that we're here for a reason. We're here for a purpose. And if we can live and fulfill our purpose for greatness for ourselves, we can then pass that on. So all the things that happened to me in South Central Los Angeles, everything happened for a reason. Mm. I am here in Australia. Mm. I've been here for 31 years. Mm. Over the past 19 years, I have spoken to over 1 million teenagers. Mm. 1 million teenagers Ooh. have heard my, my story. They have heard my vision. They've heard my purpose. And they've heard mm. the underlying messages that I have that mm. irrespective of your race, your color, your skin, your religion, what street you live in, what school you go to, what your parents have done, what they think about you, what society says, what political persuasion you have in your life. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is, are you strong enough? Do you have enough belief level? Are you willing to do what it takes to have the best possible life that you can have? And if you can live with that belief, if you can walk that fine line between reality and dreams, if you can do the things that are necessary, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks, mm. you can design your own legacy. Mm. And skin color doesn't matter. Mm. And when I look at someone, I don't look at them by mm. how they look, mm. I look at them how they act and mm. what they are showing. So you have seen a lot in your life talk about let go of your past and focusing on a clear future and your opinion what are a few things schools could do differently to ensure our future leaders of australia leave the educational system with the ability to make a positive impact on the world we live in there's too much pressure being put on young people to be perfect Everyone is flawed. Everyone makes mistakes. There should be more emphasis placed on people dreaming big. You know, looking at their lives and going, okay, what is possible for me based on how I feel? Mm. When I was in, in primary school, 
one of my teachers had this exercise, and this exercise was everyone in the classroom, take out a piece of paper and draw a picture of yourself five, 10, 15 years from now. And I sat there and I just, I didn't know what to, what to write. And the reason why I didn't know what to write or draw is because I was focused on what I see right now. You see, when I was in the backyard of my house at home, I would pretend like I was on the basketball court and I was taking the last shot. Five, four, three, two, one. The shot goes in! Eric Bailey's won the game! And I visualized the cheerleaders with their pom-poms going, go, go, Eric! And I was like, yo, baby, what's up, right? It, it was a great feeling. I loved it. It was fun. And then I would go in the house and I would tell my parents what I had done. And they were like, oh, that's great, son. But then on the way to school, the negativity hit me. When I got in the classroom, my teacher was like, oh, Eric, you got an F on your last test paper. Or, you know, go and sit in the back of the classroom. But that feeling of doing something amazing was gone. I was living in what I saw. And I believe schools should now do more to give young people an opportunity to dream big. You see, that day, I did draw a picture of what I saw. I drew, a picture, I drew a picture of myself sitting in a jail cell with a headstone said, rest in peace. I drew myself with the stone saying, born in 1960, died in 1974. Because I didn't believe that I could live much longer based on what I saw every day. Mm. The only reason why I'm here right now is because one student in the class walked over to me while I was showing my picture to the class and she gave me another picture. And then she showed me a picture of me in college. She showed a picture of me playing professional basketball. And I took that picture to my teacher and said, what do you think? And one teacher, one teacher in the whole school looked at me and said, if you wanna do this, you have to do more, dream more. And that took, teacher took an onus and started working with me. The teacher didn't do a whole lot of work with math and science and religion and all that. Did more with me on personal development, growing a belief level in myself. So if we want students, whether it be in Australia or New Zealand or the United States or the United Kingdom or Singapore, it doesn't matter. We need to work on building a belief level that more is possible, but you have to believe. And I think that's where we need to start. I have looked at your website and Twitter feeds. What I love about you is that you go in and spend time encouraging and talking to school children. Something I have done as well and enjoyed. Your passion, energy and drive would be a breath of fresh air to some school kids. What do you enjoy most about speaking to over 100 schools per year? Back in 1996, the uh, Queensland Teachers Credit Union, now the Queensland QTMB, they asked me to join a program. And the program was going into schools, sharing my experiences about my life in South Central Los Angeles, my life in Australia, and what were some of the lessons that I have learned that will allow those students to actually go on and to have, you know, better lives. When I'm in front of students, I have a sense of I belong here because when I'm in front of students, I can feel that they're hanging on some things that I'm talking about that are going to allow them to walk out of the classroom and just do life bigger do it better, do it more frequently, and have passion and enjoyment. And that enthusiasm and that energy that I get from them, it takes me back to when I was a student and looking at how I wish I would have had someone who was, you know, larger than life and who could sit down with them and, you know, and cry with them and slap high fives and talk, talk about, you know, tales of the hood and talk about some of the people that I've worked with. I mean, it's, it's that whole energy. And the other thing about that is that when they go home and they talk to their parents, their parents can look at them and say, you know what, there's something different about you. What happened at school today? 
And then they can open up the lines of communication with their parents who can realize, okay, right, we didn't know you had a dream. We didn't know that you wanted to do that. And now that we can see that you have this fire burning inside you, let me help you. So what I'm trying to do is to change the family dynamics at home, but it starts with the kids at school. And that's what I enjoy the most. And of course, the comments, the feedbacks on Facebook and Twitter and the emails and the testimonials from schools and from parents and from students. And even now, you know, I get students who have now graduated from university and I could be in a shopping center and they, hey, hey man, you, I remember you, 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 you're the dude that came to my school. Oh man, I just graduated from university. Thanks a lot. Oh, thanks man, you know, and I say, well, you know, I helped you get to, you know, why don't you give your brother some money, man? Why don't you help a guy out? No, I'm just playing. So, you know, it's that reciprocal energy and passion that I get from them is what I enjoy about going into, stu into, going into schools. What has been your best memory of your speaking career? Can you please give an example of both your school talks, corporate talks and workshops? Well, okay, I'll start with the, the corporate first. Uh, about seven years ago, uh, I had the, the privilege of actually uh, speaking uh, in America at, at an event. And after I spoke at the event, actually, it was, it was, it was right, uh, actually, it was eight years ago. I, my memory's bad, but it was right before Barack Obama became president. It was like the, the same month. I was actually in Chicago. And I remember I was, went to an event to speak, and Barack Obama won that night. And when I actually went to the event, um, basically, no one showed up because everybody was... Uh, Everybody was uh, celebrating, so no one showed up to event. It was a very small number, and I remember walking into the I remember walking into the event and realizing, "Wow, no one's here." And I got on stage, and in my mind, I was thinking, "Man, there's no one here." I mean, there's about 10 people here, and it was supposed to be 150. But when I was on stage, I realized something. It doesn't matter whether it's 10. Whether it's 20, whether it's 50, whether it's 1,000 or 6,000, like in Melbourne with Sir Richard Branson, mm. even though I have the opportunity to speak, I'm going to give 100%. I did my talk. At the end of the talk, I remember walking off stage, and one lady walked over to me, and she said to me, thank you very much. My business is bad. My marriage is bad. My health is bad. But hearing you speak, I realize now I have a lot to fight for. I'm going to go home and I'm going to get this stuff under control. Two years later, this same individual actually called me up on the phone and said, Eric, I just want to tell you, you have saved my life. My marriage is back on track. My kids love me. My health is great. And now I've now got a promotion in my job and things are great, and I just want to thank you for what you've done. Mm. That told me right there, that message sent, was sent to me that it doesn't matter who's in front of you, it's a gift. We have a responsibility to give 100% in everything that we do, whether we're in sales, whether we're in admin. Mm. See, there are pe people out there who have jobs, and they're answering the phones, mm. and they go to work and they go, oh no, it's just a job, oh. I've just got to talk to somebody, no. You are the voice of the organization. Mm -hmm. If you're in Kohl's or if you're in Woolworths and I'm buying my groceries, it's your responsibility, it's your duty to physically be nice to me because I wanna come back and spend more money with you. Right? You hear what I'm saying, right? Okay, so that was my corporate experience. In schools, uh, there are so many, but there was this one instance and it's actually on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and you Google in uh, Never Give Up, there was a little tiny young man, about 14 years of age, who got on stage in front of 3,000 people, and he said, Eric, I've tried out for my football team, and I keep getting cut. I can't make it. He says, what should I do? And you can see me on stage, and I say, you go back to your coach, and you tell to that coach, you say, yo, coach, I'm up in the house. I want to make this team. 3,000 kids just went crazy. But this young kid, he went back to school, he went to his coach, and he said to the coach, yo coach, I'm up in the house, tell me what I need to do. Six months later, he made the team. So, as a speaker, the one thing that I want to do is I want to be more than just motivational, I want to do more than just make you feel good. I want to give you some tools, some skills, some strategies for you to take that feeling 
take that great feeling, but actually go and do some work, take some action, and that's the only way you're going to change your life. So those are the two instances that really stick out. There are more, but those are two other the big ones. Your energy is amazing, and your zest for life is what people need, what gives you energy, and a positive outlook in what sometimes is a negative world. Sorry, you got much. Just say it again, my way. Sorry. I hope I can do that. Your energy is amazing, and your zest for life is what people need, what gives you energy, and a positive outlook in what sometimes is a negative world. Yes, my, my message and my focus is delivering energy, passion, excitement, mm and a zest for what's possible. There are so many people who go to jobs, they, they go to work, and they're doing some things that they're doing because it's necessity, because they, they have to do it, you know, whether to make ends meet or whether they've, they're stuck in a rut, or one of my phrases is, they're just sitting on a nail. And there's so many corporate people out there who have just so much more in them. You know, they've got so much greatness that's just pent up in them that they just need to get it out. And when I'm speaking with them, I'm interactive. I'm, I'm in the audience. I'm, I'm, I'm really just trying to hone in on, you know what, while you're sitting there, dream bigger. You know, have that, that impetus to go out there and to turn your dreams into reality. But what's, what's, uh, what's needed is for you to believe that, that you deserve it. You see, we weren't put on this planet just to go through life and just tick the boxes. You know, we weren't here just to go through life and just to say, oh, I made it. I'm just hanging on. I'm just in survival mode. No, we're here to go out there and to dominate, take control, you know, create something that's going to be a legacy, not only for yourself, but for other people. And my energy and my passion, that's what I bring to the table. You know, I. I love it. I mean, you've seen me. You saw me in Melbourne. I was running through 6,000 people at, at the arena, you know, slapping high five and giving the dance and but and people were up and I mean, that's what I bring to the table. And look at you now. We all excited. We having a good time. And that's what it's all about. So if I can do that to my audiences, if I can have them walk out of a building, you know, whether they're the CEO or whether they're the vice president or whether they're uh, in the sales staff or sales manager, whether they're just an employee. If I can have them walk out of their, that arena or that building or that boardroom and they can look in the mirror and they can say to themselves, what can I do today that I didn't do yesterday that's going to make me better tomorrow, then that's what I'm all much for your time today. I am glad we sat down and reconnected and I am sure we will be in touch very soon. I would love to come out some time and see your work, especially in schools. I also am excited to announce now you have a little surprise for our viewers. Can you please share with us what that surprise is and what we need to do to be part of this competition? Okay, first of all, I just want to say it's been an honor and a privilege to, uh, to actually connect with you again. This is my second time of actually uh, spending some time with you. Uh, this interview has uh, really energized me for what I want to achieve in life. Love to have you come out to uh, some schools. What I'd like to do is maybe uh, have you come out to some schools and we can do, uh, get you to do some Q&A with, with my audience. So I'll be in contact with you uh, and your manager. And as far as the competition goes, this is a, an honor and a privilege for me to announce that um, we're going to give away two tickets, two free tickets um, for anyone watching this, uh, this video to, uh, to come out and uh, check out uh, me and you because you're going to be there. We're going to see Arnie Schwarzenegger, the Terminator, and we've dubbed it the Activator versus the Terminator. All you need to do is simply watch this video and then leave a comment down at the bottom. And then my team and myself, we're going to pick a couple of comments out that we feel are just off the hizzy. That means off the hook. And we're going to get you those tickets. So just remember, check out the YouTube, watch it, 
you know, get marinated in the message, leave a great comment, and then we're going to get those tickets out to you. So it's been a privilege for me to actually talk to all of you. This video is going to go viral. It is going right around the galaxy, and uh, we're looking forward to connecting with you. Go to our website, www.ericbaileyglobal.com. Once again, it's Twitter. At, uh, at Eric Bailey, and of course this YouTube. We look forward to, uh, to working with you. Love to come and work with you, and thank you very much. High five. Woo!